All right, how's that? See, you give them a little praise, the microphone starts working. So. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our worship service this evening. Uh, unfortunately, our number is not quite as big as it was this morning. Boy, we had a great turnout this morning. It was great to see everybody. Uh, but we are good for the, are glad for those who are here. And if you're joining us online, once again, we're so thankful for your presence there as well. Do have a few announcements as we get started this evening. I want to remind you of uh, this week's PTP 365 lesson. Again, is from Gary Hampton. It is entitled "How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth 302," and this is the last in a six-part series. So we encourage you to take a ch take a chance to look at that when you can. There is an area-wide uh, youth devote tonight, so you'll notice that a lot of our youth are gone. They are at Sowell Road tonight, so uh, keep them in your prayers. Hope that they have a good time and that they make it back safely. The Young at Heart group will meet for lunch at Jenna Benna Restaurant in downtown Brandon on Thursday, April the 7th at 11 a.m. There is a sign-up list and menu that are posted on the bulletin board in the foyer if you'd like to uh, take a chance to look at that and then uh, sign up, of course, if you're planning to attend. There will also be a leadership training uh, conference this uh, Saturday, April the 9th. This will be from 8 a.m. to 12 noon, and lunch will be following that and will be provided. This will be for elders, deacons, and ministers. So we'll look forward to everyone attending that. Ladies, you're invited to a Ladies' Day at the Vicksburg Church. Uh, this is on Saturday, April the 30th. Registration and breakfast begins at 9 a.m. I think there's more information about that on the bulletin board in the foyer as well. There will also be a training seminar for the safety and security team members. This will be Monday, April the 11th at 6 p.m., and it will be here at the building. Uh, the training should last about two and a half hours. If you have any questions about that, you can see Scotty Clyburn, and he'll be glad to answer those for you. And this morning we announced that Deanna Robinson and Angela Robinson had uh, requested to place membership with us here at North Brandon. Uh, I don't see them this evening, but uh, please make sure to welcome them. We're so grateful for their uh, time with us. They are, if you didn't figure it out, they are mother and daughter. They uh, don't live in the same household, but they uh, came at the same time. So we're really grateful for them. I think that's all the announcements I have this uh, to begin this worship period. And I do have some updates on our prayer concern and sick list that I will uh, bring everyone at the end of services this evening. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you, Father, for the beautiful day that we've had. We thank you for the, the worship period that we had this morning. Pray that you would watch over us, Father, as we go throughout this worship period this evening. Help us, Father, to clear our minds of the worldly things that are going on around us and to focus, Father, on bringing worship to you that would be acceptable in your sight. Father, we are so thankful for the blessings that we enjoy in this life. We know that there are many who are struggling. We pray for those in Ukraine and other places, Father, that are being oppressed at this time, and those who are not free to, uh, to worship you as they see in the Scriptures. We pray, Father, that you would continue to watch over us and help us to strive to be a shining light in this community and beyond. We pray that you'd be with all the works that we support and all those, Father, who are striving so diligently to preach your word and truth. We pray especially that you'd be with Wade and Joanna Phillips as they serve in Guam, and we just thank you, Father, for their uh, diligence, their willingness to work there, and to pray that you'd continue to bless them with opportunities to teach your word. Father, we pray that you'd go with us tonight. Help us, Father, to, uh, to do these things that we do tonight in worship in a way that pleases you and is acceptable according to your word. We thank you always for your son, Jesus. We're so grateful for his death on the cross, Father. We offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Our first song this evening will be number 895. 895. We will be singing all three verses. <clears throat> I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I want to be of service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray. 
As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing. By faith I look away to yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I'll cling to him forever and look beyond the sky and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more. Our next song will be number 300, number 300. Following this song, we will have our next prayer. <clears throat> praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love Wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. We bow while we pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. This beautiful day you've given us that we may come together and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to sing songs of praises unto you, be able to talk to you in prayer and to hear from thy word. Lord, we ask that be with all those that we have on our sick and shut-in list. We have many on the prayer to center list that need, needs our prayers. Lord, we ask to be with James and Sandra as they're going through the medical problems that they have, that the doctors and nurses may do the best they can with them. Lord, we ask you to be with this congregation as it works in this area and be with their elders, 
be with their deacons, be with their ministers, and be with each of us that may live and do the things you'd have us to do that may be an example before others. Lord, we ask that be with the leaders of our country that may we may continue to be able to come together and meet us as we are without harm and other problems we could be having. Lord, we ask that be with the Christians all around the world and those in war zones, keep them safe. Lord, we ask that now to be with us through this service, through each day of our life. Forgive us our sins. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The invitation song this evening will be number 902. Number 902. The song following before the lesson will be number 548. 548. <clears throat> I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tip me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will, to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Well, it is good to have everyone back out for our evening service. So very thankful that you're with us uh, for tonight. And I also ask, as it was mentioned in the announcements, do be mindful of our youth group and uh, those adults that are with them. Pray that they have a wonderful and uplifting time uh, for the area-wide devotion and get back home safe uh, later this evening. So we're glad that they could have those uh, started back up and be a part of that area-wide once again. Uh, tonight's lesson is a very important question from the Old Testament. And that question is, uh-oh. The question is, I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, is the TV on back there? <laughs> I'm looking at a black screen and I'm just advancing it here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could see the light shining up there in the projector. All right, there we go. When Greg's not here, I think Greg helps to do a lot of that stuff, and so we, we miss Greg when, when he is not here. So uh, the important question, what does the Lord require? 
You know, think about a re requirement. A, a requirement is an absolute necessity. Uh, it, it's a demand. A, a requirement is not an option that we can choose to do it if we want to or not. You know, it's not really left up to us. A requirement is a demand. And there are a lot of things in life that come with requirements. You know, we, have, uh, we are blessed to have a lot of, of young children in our congregation, especially we've got infants in the congregation. You know, those infants come with requirements. Uh, you, you find out about all of them once you have one. Uh, and so just think, in order to, to be here tonight with that, that little infant, it had requirements. You had to have transportation, obviously, to get here. But you also had to have a child car safety seat. You had to have extra diapers, baby wipes, pacifiers, bottles, formula, a towel maybe for burping, you know, a, a, a rattle or hopefully a, a quiet toy, maybe a teething ring, an extra set of clothes for accidents. I remember those days. You never know when they're going to happen. And so all those requirements, and you may have thought of some things. Well, Tim, you forgot this and you forgot that. Well, it's been a while since we've had to travel around with, with infants. We're going to be doing it again with the grandchild. So thankful for that. But those, those requirements, and you might think, well, man, man, those requirements, man, they're a hassle. It's no fun dealing with all of those requirements. Well, sometimes that may be true, but I'm telling you, requirements are intended for our good. Uh, I, I do remember uh, learning to wrestle with the child safety car seat, trying to get in the back of that, that little car that we had at the time and, and getting it in there and getting it tight. You know, you, you, you hook it and then and it, it's doing this. It's, you know, if, if it's moving forward and backward and side to side, you hadn't done it right. And so you think about, you know, that, that's a hassle, yes, but in an accident, that car will save your baby's life. See, those requirements are there for our good. And so what does the Lord require of us for our good? Well, we have the answer to that in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 10, beginning verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I, I command you today, notice, for your good. See, requirements are there because they're for our good. So just like that child car safety is a requirement for your good, God says these requirements are for your eternal good. And so what does the Lord require of us? Well, first he mentions that he requires that we fear him. The word fear there in the Hebrew is yareh. It means to fear to be in terror is one way of looking at it, but, but uh, metaphorically or, or uh, morally, it means to revere or to have reverence for. And that's how I think it's used in this passage with God. God demands and he requires that we respect him, that we admire him, that we have reverence for him, that we see him uh, for the, the majesty that he is. Well, how does God then teach us to have that level of, of respect and admiration for him? How does God teach us to respect? Well, he does it through our parents. Leviticus 19 and verse 3 says, Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths from the Lord your God. He says, you're going to revere. And brethren, if you look at the, the Hebrew, the word revere there is the same word. It's Yahweh. It's the same word in Deuteronomy chapter 10, to fear. You shall fear your mother and your father. You shall respect them. When we are learning, when we learn to respect our mother and father, what we're doing is we're, we're learning to respect authority. You know, they, they are the authority over the child. And so the child is learning to respect the authority. And there is no greater authority than God. And so when we learn to respect the authority of our parents, ultimately God is teaching us to respect him. We're learning that respect through our parents and it's important we understand to fail to do this 
That was a major thing in God's eyes. If, if, a, if a child failed to respect his or her parents, that was a, a major infraction. And God called for the most serious of penalties. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, beginning verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his voice of his father, the voice of his mother, and who, when he, uh, they have chastened him, will not heed them, then the father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all of the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. All Israel will hear and learn to fear. See, that's what God is teaching, respect and uh, reverence for parents, and ultimately respect and reverence for him. They learn to fear their parents, their authority, and they learn to respect God and his authority. And the word fear here is the same one used in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse, verse 12. And so people learn to reverence and respect God by reverencing and respecting their parents. And what does that type of reverence produce? If we're going to have that reverence, that you'd think that God would tell us, you know, the, the benefits or, or the perks for, for having that reverence. So what does it produce in our lives? Well, it will help us to live righteously, to have righteous behavior. Exodus chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 21. But the midwives feared God. They had reverence and respect for God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Verse 21, and so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Here we find that these, these, uh, these midwives, because they feared God, they had reverence and respect for God, they did not do what Pharaoh commanded. He wanted them to kill the little male children. You know, to, to destroy them because uh, he was fearful of a revolt, a rebellion from the, the slaves. So he said, you kill the little boys, but they said, no, we fear God. You know, this is not what God wants. And so they refused. And so their reverence actually produced righteous behavior in their lives. Here's another benefit of, of awe and, and admiration and reverence for God. It brings happiness to us. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed, happy is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commands. And so in his commandments. So the word uh, blessed there means happy. Happiness. Happy is the man who fears and reverences the Lord, who does what he commands. When we respect God... When we obey his commands, we can have joy and, and happiness and, and blessedness in knowing that we have a home in heaven. God is going to usher us into his heavenly kingdom because we fear and reverence him. And so look at these blessings. When we do fear the Lord, we're, we're living righteously, righteous behavior. We, we are now happy. What are all these things that go into making us happy and blessed. We'll look at Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. When God sees us being the example that we ought to be before the world and before those who are in the world, we are reverencing God and we are, are being faithful to God. God says, I, I'm going to give you my goodness. I am storing up my goodness for those who fear me. The word goodness there means that which is best, beauty, gladness, welfare to go well with. God says, okay, people, if you will fear me, if you will reverence me and respect me and do what I command, I will make sure that it goes well with you in eternity. Oh, you're going to be so glad that you had this reverence and respect for me because I am going to bring you into that goodness. Here's another 
benefit of having this reverence and respect for God. Psalm 34, verse 9, O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, there is no want to those who fear him. There is no want. Uh, that means that there's no deficiency. There is no, no lack, no poverty. Those who fear God and, and keep his commandments, God through his providence, he provides. He works things out for them. We also in Psalm 103 verse 11, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. And so we get God's goodness. We have no want, no lack, and we have his mercy, his kindness, his favor, his doing good for us. And in Psalm 145 verse 19, He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him, he also will hear their cry and save. He's going to do what we need. He's going to give us those, those desires, that heavenly home, that protection, that salvation. The word save there means to defend, to deliver, to help, to rescue, to bring salvation. God is bringing salvation with him when he comes to claim us. When we reverence and obey him, all of these great things are provided for us. And he gives us a warning in the scriptures. He says, don't look out at the world and see, see the world living in corruption and living in evil and think that that's the way that you ought to go. Do not be, be fooled by those that do not fear God. Ecclesiastes 8, beginning verse 12. It says, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, Yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. You know, sometimes we look at those in the world, and it may seem that they just get away with everything. How many times have you looked at someone who is worldly, who's corrupt, who's sinful, and, and you know they're doing bad things, but they just never seem to get caught we ought not then think that we should follow their example because they may not have to deal with the trouble in this life, but they're going to be highly troubled in the next life. It will not go well with them in eternity. And so what does God require of us? Well, he requires that we fear him. We, we have to have reverence and respect for God. Then the second thing that was mentioned there in that passage, Deuteronomy, is that God requires that we walk in his ways. The word walk there means to follow, to walk carefully. To, to carefully place your steps uh, so that you are, are following the path. We need to carefully follow after God because I'm telling you, apostasy occurs when people stop walking carefully in the way of the Lord. Uh, people fall away from the truth and begin to walk in the way of evil when they're not careful to walk in the Lord's way. Book of 2 Kings, in 2 Kings chapter 13, beginning verse 10, says, In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoiahaz, became king over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all of the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked in them. And so we've got an example here of someone who, who walked in the way of sin. He chose to do that. The path that we walk is our choice. And brethren, we're all going to walk a path. It is not possible to go through this life uh, to not be on a path. And that path is our choosing. Here we find that Jehoash, he chose to walk in the way of evil. And God is going to punish him for that. We must make a better choice. We've got to choose to walk in the way of the Lord so that we can be blessed by him. Another passage, book of Jeremiah chapter 7, again verse 23. But this is what I command, commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their own evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. Here we find that these people 
Uh, they did not walk in, in the ways of the Lord, but they followed the dictates of their own heart. How many times have you heard someone say, well, just follow your heart? Listen to your heart. Uh, let your heart be your guide. Be true to your heart. Well, that sounds, sounds nice. You know, it's a, it's a nice platitude that we sometimes hear. But brethren, that's dangerous. It is dangerous to simply follow the dictates of your heart because if your heart is not governed by God and His Word, your heart is evil. Say, well, man, that's awful harsh to say somebody got an evil heart. Brethren, my heart is evil apart from the Word of God. Everyone's heart is evil apart from the Word of God. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so just as anyone's, I'm talking about, talking about the heart, we're talking about the mind, the conscience. Anyone's conscience, anyone's heart, anyone's mind that is not governed by God and His Word is prone to lead them into error. We've got to follow God. We've got to walk in His ways. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14 to 15, it says, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. I like this passage. It says, When you are tempted to walk in the evil way, recognize it for what it is, turn your back on it, and walk on by. Just walk away from it. It's good advice. Don't walk in the way of evil. Walk in the ways of the Lord. And then we have the third requirement that God gives us there in Deuteronomy 10. God requires that we love Him. The word love there means to have affection for it. It is to, to have affection for the, the object of your delight, uh, the object of your desire. We need to love God. And there are a number of verses that teach us to love God. Matter of fact, Psalm 116, beginning verse 1 here uh, the psalmist says, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Here the psalmist gives two reasons. He says, these are the reasons why I love God. I love God because he's heard my voice, and I, I love God because he has inclined his ear to me. He has heard me, and he will continue to hear me. He said, that's why I choose to love God. And we can also look at Psalm 145, verse 20. The Lord preserves all who love Him, but all the wicked He will destroy. There it says that He will preserve. The Lord preserves those who love Him. It means to hedge about as with thorns, to guard or to protect. And so the Lord protects those who love him. It, it's like he is a, a hedge of protection around them. Does, does that sound familiar? What did Satan say of Job about why Job served God? He said, well, the only reason he serves you is because you put a hedge around him and you won't let me touch him. You're protecting him. So that's what God wants to do. God wants to protect us. And if we will use his word to govern our lives, that word does serve as a protection against sin. It helps us to overcome temptation. And so God wants to protect those who love him. And because of the love that God has for his people, he has done wonderful things. There's a passage in the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> If you would open up your Bible, you can follow along there, and we read it together. Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. The context of this passage, God is actually rebuking them. And basically the message is, God is saying, look at what I've done for you. Look at how I have loved you, and look at what you've done for me in return. And he's going to describe the love that he has for his people. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. And he's going to describe in poetic terms how he has viewed them. Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. 
As for your nativity, the day of your birth, on the day that you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field where you yourself were loathed on the day that you were born. And when I passed by, when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. God says, when I found you, you were like a baby that was thrown out to die. You you were like a a baby on the the day that it was born. Nobody, your, your cord was not cut. Nobody took care of you. They just threw you out like garbage. And I found you. And because I loved you, I said, live. He goes on in the passage and describes how Israel grew. He describes her as a a young woman. He says, you grew, and as you grew, I I, I bathed you. I gave you the finest clothes. I I adorned you with the most precious of of ornaments and jewels. And I, I wanted you to be my bride. I wanted you to be my wife. I took you as wife, but you were unfaithful. You were unfaithful. You went to the false gods and and you have turned your back on the one who's done all of these things because I loved you and you have, you've rejected me. What a sad picture that is. But even in this tragic vision of God's people, you see his love. God did this for for his people because he loved them and he wanted them to be his, but they rejected him. God requires that we love him. And then also, number four, God requires that we serve him. The word serve there means to work, to be in bondage, to be subject to a master. And so basically saying, look, you, you, if you want my blessings, you're going to have to become my slave. Man, you know, especially in today's society, you know, talking about slavery is not a good thing. But he says, if you want what I'm offering, you've got to become my slave. You've got to become my servant. But the, the, the unique thing about this is that it is a voluntary servitude. We choose. God's not going to make anybody become his slave. God's not going to make anybody serve him. It is a free choice on our part. And he actually has within his word a a wonderful passage that describes this. You know, that passage from Ezekiel was a passage showing how God loves his people. But there's a passage in Exodus chapter 21 that talks about God's people choosing to love him. If you would open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 21, we begin at verse 2. And this this passage is about... God's people choosing to love him and be his servant. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters. He shall go out by himself. But... If the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. You've probably heard the song that a lot of times young people sing, Pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door. That's where that song comes from. It's based upon this passage. And in this we see a, a, a man, a, a, a bonded servant, choosing to stay a slave because he loves his master. And he, he loves the blessings that he has had in his master's home. He says, I don't want to go out free. I, I want to stay your servant. I want to stay your slave. And the master says, great. You know, you've been good. You're a faithful servant. And so he, he, he allows the judges to know this man has chosen to, to be my servant. And he took him to the door and he pierced his ear with that sharp metal awl and put a ring in that ear, signifying 
that he is now a forever slave. Brethren, when we're baptized into the waters uh, of Christ, in essence, we're signifying that we are a forever slave. That we have taken Christ as our master. We are choosing to serve him because we love him. He's our master. John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, be my servant. This is how we serve him, by keeping his commandments. We also serve him by serving those around us. Go to, again, open up your Bible to Matthew 25. We'll read verses 34 through verse 40. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. See, we serve God. We are his servants when we obey his commands. We are his servants when we serve one another. When we, we seek to, to help and encourage and, and to offer comfort to one another, that, in essence, we are serving him. And if we fail to offer that help, if we fail to offer that encouragement, if we don't take care of one another, then, in essence, we're not taking care of God. We serve him by being obedient and by serving others. The Lord requires that we serve him. And then the final one that is mentioned in, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 is that God requires that we keep his commandments. The word keep there is the same word translated preserve. We read a moment ago in, in Psalm 145 in verse 20 where it said it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was defined as to hedge about with thorns, to guard, to protect. And so God protects us when we are obedient and when we meet those requirements. But here it says God requires that we keep his commandments. The word keep there is something that we do. And so not only does God keep and preserve those who fear him, we are to keep and preserve his commandments. We are to keep and preserve them in view of obeying them. We see the same word used also in Deuteronomy 11, verse 32. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. That word there, observe, that's the same word, to hedge about as with thorns, to guard, to protect. Be careful to protect God's commands. Honor them. Obey them. The King James structures it a little differently. It says, and you shall observe to do. Be careful to do, fulfill, accomplish God's commands. Guard his word and be obedient to it. And as we close our service tonight, we can think about the blessings that come to those who will do that. What blessings come to those who keep his commandments? Exodus 20 verse 6, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. God's mercy. Think about God's grace, his goodness, uh, his, his acts of goodness that he accomplishes for us. God gives his mercy to those who keep his commandments. Book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 11, verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Here's another great blessing of keeping his commandments. We are adopted into his family. He becomes our father. We become his children, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because we keep his commands. And one final verse, Proverbs 4, verse 20 and 22 through 22. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. You know, it, it, it helps you in life. It helps you to have a, a better life here. But it says they are life to those who find them. There is the blessing of eternity 
For those who keep the commands of God, God requires that we keep his commandments. As we close this evening, you know, there are things that God requires us to do. Those requirements are not optional. Uh, they, they are necessary and they must be fulfilled by us if we are to have him save us from our sins. They're not optional. We've got to meet those requirements. So tonight, how are you doing in those requirements? How are you doing in meeting these things and, and the other things in the scriptures that God requires of us? How are you faring in that? Is, or is there something in your life that you need to repair? Is there some change in life that you need to commit to God? If there is, now is the time to make that commitment. We're not promised tomorrow. All that we know for sure that we have is this very moment right now. So if there is a need that you have tonight, why don't you come right now while we stand and while we sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.